welcome to the Swindon Festival of Literature, or rather to the virtual online Swindon Festival of Literature. Thanks very much for joining us. We hope that everything is well where you are. Now we are pleased and grateful that hum human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this festival show to go on. Well, at least online. Today's guest has, in a manner of speaking, a history with Swindon. With his literary detective Thursday Next books, this hugely popular author has made Swindon a place of wit, intrigue, and um, a little weirdness, where literature is more popular than football, dodos roam the parks, and mammoths ruin your flower beds. But today he will talk about his newest book, which is set elsewhere. Maybe that's a relief for us, but we'll see. Please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature online welcome to friend of Swindon and prolific author, Jasper Ford. Jasper, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're very pleased you're able to take part uh, and we'd rather have you in Swindon, um, but never mind. It's dodo free now, by the way, um, but never mind. Here's, here's a very easy first question for you, Jasper. Um, have you ever been to Swindon in spring or at any other time? Uh, I have been to Swindon many times. Um, I, I used to live quite near Marlborough, which, as you know, is not a stone's throw. So Swindon was my, my big, uh, you know, my local town. And I remember, I mean, all you young things out there won't recall a time when the middle of the Brunel Centre wasn't open to the elements at both sides. And the day before, the, the times before Sunday shopping, I used to take my, my girls, my twin girls, I used to take my unicycle and they used to take their trikes and we used to cycle all the way round the completely abandoned Brunel Centre right through that that centre bit with disembodied voices saying get, get, get no cycling in the Brunel Centre like this and then we had like chips down at McDonald's on the corner there uh, that was that was 30 years ago so yes I, I do know Swindon uh, pretty well I must say. Um, you you speak like a Swindonian, plus a Sean. <laughs> 30 years ago, it's like that here today. It's wonderful. And uh, we could talk about football. We could talk about Swindon's great victory in the relegation zone. But but uh, but we're dealing with literature today. So let's let's focus on that. Um, in fact, let's go to the topic in hand. Your newest book, your latest book, uh, The Constant Gardener. We'll ask you about that title in a minute. Um, it raises many eyebrows, it raises laughs, but maybe most of all, it raises questions. How could it take a rabbit to teach a human uh, humanity and many other things? Uh, over to you, Jasper. Haha, <laughs> over to me. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, the constant rabbit. So this, uh, this is uh, what, what I generally do when I start writing a book is I, I have this sort of way of writing, which I, which I call the, the narrative dare. And, and that is basically, as, as the name suggests, I start off um, with just a, a, a rather bizarre idea and then I kind of see where it runs. And I had this kind of odd idea that what if we shared our country with anthropomorphized rabbits? OK, these are rabbits who are six foot tall. They can drive cars. They can talk. Uh, they, you know, shop. They live in houses. They wear clothes. And, and we kind of share the space with them. And, and I thought, okay, well, where do we sort of, where do we kind of go with this? And I thought, well, maybe they're not welcome. Maybe in 1968, when this thing happened, when these, these rabbits, there were originally 18 rabbits that were anthropomorphized in this sort of freak event that no one to this day has, has been able to uh, uh, describe or explain. And I know, and, in initially and they were met with sort of wow this is amazing and welcome and talk to us and tell us about how fantastic this is and blah 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 but as the years go by that 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 sort of elation has kind of turned to suspicion and fear and now um, rabbits live very much on the margins of society they're, they're the humans uh, decide how they're going to live where they're going to live and as the story opens um, there is talk of rehoming the 1.2 million anthropomorphized rabbits to a, um, a sort of mega warren in Wales. Clearly, 
you know, for their own protection, you know, to protect them from, from those dangerous um, hominid supremacists who are always trying to make their life just a little bit miserable. So that's the kind of premise of the book. And I thought, well, okay, well, where do, where do, we, where do we start off? Well, there's a little village in the middle of Herefordshire, which is called, um, uh, which is called Little uh, Much Hemlock. Sorry, it's a great, great name for a village, Much Hemlock. And um, my protagonist, who is a rather ordinary uh, person, rather ordinary human, um, who works for the Rabbit Compliance Task Force, which, as you might imagine, is perhaps a, uh, not that friendly to rabbits. Um, and he has a very ordinary, you know, very ordinary life. Um, he lives there with his uh, with his daughter. And then all of a sudden, a family of rabbits uh, move in next door. Now, this slightly complicates things uh, for Peter Knox, my, my hero, because he and Connie Rabbit, Mrs. Rabbit, kind of had a little bit of a sort of, you know, well, not a fling, but certainly they knew one another at, at university. And it's, you know, it's like 35 years later. And the rest of the village really want to get rid of the rabbits. They say, well, you know, you know what rabbits are like, you know, they sort of, they, they breed constantly and they have that, you know, radical vegan agenda and the ears are big, just a little bit creepy. And once you let a family in, then before you know it, there'll be tons of rabbits and well, we'll be overrun. And that's kind of where the story really kicks off. And it's about, it's about Peter Knox and his relationship with, with the rabbits and really questioning everything uh, about himself and about, uh, and about humans and how we treat not only other humans, uh, but this in, in this particular story, yeah, how we treat um, other animals as well. So there's an awful lot of sort of little interesting uh, sort of questions that I can, I can ask about, about humans and, and their dealing with rabbits um, and humans and their dealing with other rabbits, the demonized other, if you like, but also some questions about um, about uh, being being British, really, and uh, identifying as British and how you see yourself. And and I think for me, as very much, you know, um, I am I am British and I'm I'm sixty now, and I grew up very much in that sort of sort of really kind of still post-war exceptionalism, triumphalism. We won the war, but also a kind of post-loss of empire. And for centuries I think the British sort of really define themselves by this sort of striding across the globe and you know doing good in very much um you know uh, inverted you know quote marks and and really dealing with that loss of empire and how we still maintain this strange sort of sense that we're this huge huge mega power when in fact really we're just sort of living on this little island and kind of perhaps fooling ourselves a little bit. So there's all kinds of little interesting sort of asides I can throw in there. But, um, you know, before you all go, oh my God, this sounds really heavy and I really don't want to read it, which of course uh, is the last thing I would want you to do, is that this is allegory. This is just fun and silly and yes, there are serious ideas, but it's also comedy as well. So I draw on um, lots and lots of different sources from this. There's, um, there's a bit of bedroom farce in there because uh, obviously, um, you know, clearly um, Connie, everyone thinks that Connie and Peter are having an affair, including Miss, Mr. Rabbit, uh, Doc, uh, who, um, who, was, who was called Doc, obviously, because, you know, what's up, Doc, and everything, and that kind of stuck. You know, he used to be, uh, be ex-military. Uh, and then you then we reveal that there might be a, a rabbit underground, um, you know, that uh, perhaps there is a sort of resistance movement going on within the, within the rabbit community. And we look at the rabbit community. We look at the way in which they run their lives. They have something called the rabbit way, which is a completely different way of, uh, of existing within within society and the biosphere than, than we do. And, uh, and as Peter sort of sees, you know, the way in which rabbits uh, rabbits run their lives um he he sort of becomes drawn to this rather sustainable and pleasant and rather sort of you know all-encompassing um and pluralist um society um but as the story goes on um obviously things become uh, perhaps a, a little bit uh, darker there's an antagonist who um who i had a lot of fun with that i won't tell you too much about because it will be a massive spoiler alert yeah. but as the story progresses all kinds of interesting things slot into place and the story really kind of sort of tells tells itself to be honest um, I can't tell you too much about the end again because of um, 
uh, massive spoiler alerts. But, um, but suffice to say that um, I think there's kind of a lot of understanding and misunderstanding going on between rabbits and humans. Uh, it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting point, you know, because a question that often comes up is, you know, why rabbits? You know, this is an interesting one for me. Um, and really, I don't think I could have written it about any other, any other creature, because we have a very confused relationship with animals. And in particular, and I think this is typified, by the human's relationship, um, not only, well, not only with animals, but with each other. But with, with rabbits, it's particularly confused because, um, because on the one hand, uh, we have them as, as pets. And if you were to be cruel to a pet rabbit, you would probably end up in court, yet humans uh, murder rabbits by their literally hundreds of millions um, and even language you know language is a very interesting thing when you talk about you know the demonization of of the minority other because rabbits of course when when we are well uh you know when we we think well of them they are they are cute and they are cuddly and they are fluffy uh but when we are not well disposed to rabbits uh, we call them a vermin a pest and a plague so there's a sort of duality within the relationship we have with these our little cute, curry, cum, cuddly, furry creatures that we do and we don't like all at the same time. Uh, we've experimented on them. We've tried to murder them in any, any way uh, possible, bacteriological warfare. Um, there's, you know, no more, no more indignities heaped upon rabbits that haven't at one time been heaped upon uh, humans to other humans. So they do a very good proxy, proxy human. Um, actually really quite well and the more you look into it the more disturbing it all rather looks but um, yeah there is there is lots of fun lots of uh, comedy in there as well and I hope uh, you know you find it an enjoying um, and edifying read that perhaps will make you laugh but also go hmm you know things that make you go hmm I, I do I do like that that idea things that question but anyway, that's um, that's um, pretty much uh, uh, what it's what it's all about. Um, but I'm sure you have uh, some questions for me, Matt. Um, Jasper, thanks very much. I do indeed, and I'm really glad uh, you were aware of spoiler alerts because uh, um, if people if people haven't read this book, I want them to read it, if only to have the serious fun that I had when reading it, and uh, the risk of being boastful. I am a very discriminatory reader. I don't mm. like all the books I'm asked to read for review or other things. And uh, when I read out the chapter, an early chapter, Fuds and Flopsy, by the way, Jasper loves alliteration. Um, <laughs> if you can shoehorn it in, it'll be there. And even that makes it, brings mm. us fun. But in the chapter Fuds and Flopsy, which I read to my wife over the Sunday breakfast table, she interrupted me, said, Boy, he's having fun, isn't he? <laughs> and I wanted yeah. her to take it seriously. And yeah. it's a really interesting point, Jasper. Uh, I don't know how much more we can say about it. This idea that one thinks of serious things while laughing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting problem. Um, uh, from for me writing, you know, because I wanted to write about what I saw, you know, the the levels of discrimination with within the within the country, and you know, I, I got I got to sixty years of age. I mean, I basically got you know won the the lottery uh, without actually having to buy a ticket. I ended up you know male, white, uh, European, moneyed, and everything else. I mean, if you basically you know on the on the sort of um, privilege uh, top trump score, uh, I don't have a title. And I didn't go to Oxbridge, but otherwise, you know, I've got the lot. Um, so it's no surprise, you know, if, if I when I say that I've got to 60 years of my life without ever being discriminated against, like ever, you know, there's no time where somebody has, you know, done something against me. And, and that's not unusual. But it's very easy for me and anyone who looks like me to kind of think, um, you know, well, you know, uh, what, what's, what's everyone complaining about Britain? You know, it's fine. You know, I've never had any of this. Um, and it's, that's very easy. But of course, that is not something, you know, getting to 60 years of life without being discriminated on is not something that my fellow countrymen share, you know, not by a long way. So, so wanting to tell a story like this, but how do I, you know, looking like I do, 
you know, where do I come from to tell this kind of story? And I thought, well, I'll kind of t- tell it from the, the viewpoint of, of myself, someone who who ha- did not see for many years what was what was going on around, but then slowly, you know, c- came to understand that there is a, another different story. That the the um, that the um, experience of being British is, of course, not the same for for all people, you know. Um, so so but then I also thought well I don't want to make it you know not sort of dry and dull and preachy and boring so allegorical is actually a great way to go and to use a long established tradition of um, of you know um, of basically tra- tragicomic tragicomic you know happy sad and I and so I was chatting to a friend of mine about this because I was struggling with this early on about what tone to take within the, the book and the approach and I said, well, I want it to be funny, but I want it to be, I want it to be like very at the same time. And, 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 uh, and she said, you know, well, do you remember watching MASH, you know, on the telly? And I went, oh yeah, no, that was pretty good, wasn't it? And I said, yeah. So, so all of a sudden it was very funny and there was Hawkeye and, you know, doing all those, you know, great knockabout, you know, knockabout comedy. And then, and then instantly bang, incoming wounded. And then you're in the operating theater. And all of a sudden this was very real and, you know, and people, were going to die and this was war and this was you know this was really unpleasant so it's it's something that works it can work and it does work and and it was just sort of finding the right tone and sometimes you know because I'm a bit of a sort of frivolous person at heart I think sometimes I flip over too much into the silliness because I, I can't I can't you know help myself but I do feel there is you know there is perhaps some um, a serious side to the book um, that I mean a lot of my books have, have, have this sort of serious sort of underbelly you know going on and certainly this book we're, along with Early Riser and Shades of Grey um, which attack various things I mean Shades of Grey I wrote which was you know very much based on uh, on a sort of class class strictures you know the, the the immovable class strictures within the society so it's kind of a bit of a, a sort of journey for me but um, but yeah I just I just hope it works. And, and, and it works, Jasper, because the, the, the allegory that you use actually makes things more, almost more recognisable than if you actually spelled them out all the time. I was, mm. I was feeling something there that I recognised and I felt a discomfort. Um, now that you've referred to your own past, I'd just like to ask you one, one little more question about that. How mm. you said you refer, even refer to your own education or whatever. How did you get to be so literary? Because you scatter... Latin phrases in here, you allude to other writers, uh, to, to titles, all sorts of references that one can either pick up or leave alone. But mm. they're, they're all over the place and, and they were there in the, in, the, uh, in the Thursday Next books as well. Where's that coming mm. from? If you, if you don't mind saying a little bit more about your personal uh, yeah. development. Uh, no, no, not at all. I mean, I've always, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't really benefit hugely from the education I had at, at school. Um, I had a massively expensive um, education, which I think was probably money not well spent at all. Um, I think probably going on holidays would have perhaps, you know, been better for my parents, really, or, you know, something or buying a conservatory or a new car probably would have been a bit better. But um, but I've always I've always loved story and I've always had a very um, inquiring mind. And I do like reading and looking at stuff. And, and I think that's really where all this sort of illusion comes from. I was reading my cla- the classics, not so much at school, but in my 20s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in, in, the, um, the, in my um, Thursday Next series, uh, the first one is called The Air Affair, which is about mm-hmm. someone kidnapping uh, Jane Eyre out of Jane Eyre. Um, I didn't read Jane Eyre, I think, until I was about 22 or 23, which I think is probably quite unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was uh, playing catch up. I think in my twenties uh, for for the lack of an education, um, but I've just never stopped reading, never stopped sort of read, reading, studying, looking at things. Um, the the Latin um, uh, that I put in the book um, is actually um, yes is spoken by a character um, who constantly quotes Latin um, in a sort of rather pompous and uh, and, and um, shall we say affected manner. Um, so uh, that's obviously a, a clear nod to perhaps a, a character in the public sphere today. Um, but I mean, I, I had that when I was a kid, you know, growing up, you know, where I would, where my parents would sort of give me a, throw a quote in French at me and I'd have no idea what they were talking about and it's kind of stuck with me. But um, no, just, you know, and Wikipedia, what a great tool, I must say. No, research, research, read, read, read. I just love it all. You're clearly a lifelong learner, the way you refer to your reading in your 20s and playing catch up. Mm. Um, 
and you also say you know you're maybe slightly frivolous at heart well i find you quite serious even though you mm. you're, you're, you're very funny um but you do know about laughing at yourself for example i mean your name is uh, is an old anglo-saxon name with a double f forward i think well, that's where it comes from from a river crossing or something but you make the nasty character in the book the fox he has your name effectively mm. Um, yeah, well, with the with the with the double <laughs> F and the and the double F and the E, um, I, yeah. I think that my, my name. I mean, although we do, we, we argue. I mean, the family argue about where it came from, and there might be all kinds of you know reasons for it. But I, I think it is an affectation, to be to be honest. It, you know, that they added a, an F. There was original Ford F O R D. You know, that's kind of very normal. And then someone added an E, um, and then they added an F, and it was yeah, it was let's say Smiths and Smythes. You know, it's it's just an affectation. Um, and I thought I'd just sort of um, yeah shoehorn that in. To uh, to my my uh, character's name, who who spells his name with two F's and an E, as a ridiculous affectation, and it's yeah, there's a bit of self-deprecating. But what I think the thing about self-deprecating is that um, I th I think self-criticism is probably the the most important thing about humans that is sadly lacking. Um, really sort of self-criticizing and saying, uh, is, 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 was that the right thing to do? You know, was that the right thing to do? Was I actually doing the right thing here? Are we actually the good guys, you know? And I think that's, I think that's important. So I think laughing at yourself is, uh, is actually important to do, just to show that you, you know, that you can self-criticize obviously uh, yourself. Um, and, you know, and in, in the book, I think the character, um, Peter Knox, who, who is a kind of nice but slightly spineless, uh, and I think that's that's I think he there's there's a lot of a lot of him in me, perhaps at an earlier age, um, when um, when perhaps I just I just you know joined in with all this this rubbish, um, simply because it the, it was easier not uh, to do so than not do so, you know, or I didn't see that there was any harm. So I think there's a lot of me in in Peter, um, mm. but I like to think that perhaps I might have learned something. But, you know. No, I, I think you're more Peter. I'll, I'll, I'll let other reasons. <laughs> I think, as I know you. And um, um, let's go. Let's go. Go to the book now that we've come back from you to the book. Um, mm -hmm. okay. the, the constant rabbit. Um, and people who read a bit will think of John Le Carre, the constant gardener. Um, mm. uh, any, any, any link? Any, any. Uh, why the uh, no not not really um i mean other than you know the link that people you know sort of make with it when they're looking at it no i mean the, the constant rabbit um mrs rabbit's name is uh constance, constance uh, connie cool. she's known as connie um she still holds a bit of a flame for peter after all those years so i think she's the constant rabbit in that sort of sense um but the constant rabbit also alludes uh to the uh slang term for um you know bunny rabbit chat and the constant rabbit if 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 somebody is giving you constant rabbit it means they're just talking at you in your ear but it doesn't really mean anything and i think one of the one of the threads about the constant rabbit is is whether i'm just adding to the constant rabbit because if we understand problems it's not enough just to understand them it's not enough to acknowledge a problem you have to do something about the problem and i think what i'm asking really with the constant rabbit is 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 for people to move beyond the constant rabbit because there's a lot of hand wringing you know oh, we must do better and endless you know apologies from big multinationals and and politicians but is is it just the constant rabbit do we need actually to move beyond you know um beyond just dialogue and actually having some meaningful changes to, to make some proper changes to society so everybody can enjoy um, you know the benefits and not just um, and not just a few so yeah there's a kind of so there's a triple sort of pun in the um, in the title there yeah and um and, and what with the footnotes um <laughs> you do footnotes uh, and some of them are funny yes some of them are funny and some of them are straightforward informative um, yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't. It's a funny one. Footnotes. I mean, footnotes in novels aren't generally aren't generally done. Um, uh, but I sort of quite like them in a in a weird sort of way. I. It's as though um, it's a little bit extra. I mean, the thing about footnotes is you shouldn't you, you you shouldn't be able to lose anything by not reading them. 
you should be able to ignore them completely and the story's there and but they're just a kind of little bit extra perhaps and the and what's interesting is that the the the, the voice of the the voice of the person writing the footnotes is a kind of blend between me the author and and peter knox the protagonist so it's 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 spoken from his point of view but it's knowing a little bit more and i i just i just found them a little bit amusing just just something to put in there that um that didn't have a place in the in the narrative so it was just a little bit just a little bit extra and and does an editor look at this and and comment on Oh. <laughs> well, I, I've had I have a, a tremendous editor and a, a fantastic team at Hodder, and they kind of know what I'm up to. They they know that I do things a little bit off kilter. So there's they just say no, we we like this, you know, go for it, you know, have some fun, enjoy yourself. I mean, I've used footnotes in the Thursday Next series yeah. and um, inside the book world because Thursday can travel inside um, books. And then they talk, um, they can actually communicate through something called a footnotophone. Um, so I have a little bit of, I have a little bit of previous when it comes to using, um, using footnotes and, and I'll probably carry on doing it. The, the, the last book I wrote, which is the fourth in the Dragon Slayer series, um, that includes footnotes as well, but I'm doing a sequel to Shades of Grey at the moment. And I, I don't think that does have footnotes. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of how I feel. Yeah. Um your you set it you you you've set books in swindon before um hmm. uh, you live in wales and you set this on the welsh border but, but yeah england um and i seem to recall you even apologize to the people of herefordshire <laughs> and ross on why in a very nice way um yeah why why that area why not the lake district why not basingstoke uh, why not somewhere else <laughs> Uh, well, it's, I kind of, I kind of set it in, it has to be set somewhere. I mean, I think it's important to set it somewhere. And I like, I like using rather than completely pretend um, towns like in Jane Eyre or, or um, the Archers, I kind of like to have locations that, that you can recognise and, and uh, are, are recognisable as such. So that if you were there or you know it, you go, oh yeah, no, I went to, I went in that you know, I've been into All Saints, you know, I've had a coffee in All Saints, I, I know what that's about. So I kind of had to set it somewhere. But I also wanted to, also wanted to sort of apologise to any people in Hereford who felt that I were, Herefordshire, who, who I felt were being sort of maligned, because it's, um, it, you know, Hereford, Herefordshire doesn't come out too well, the older peoples, shall we say, who live in small villages in the middle of Herefordshire don't come out too well. So I thought I'd better just say something there to, in case anyone who was not like uh, these people um, uh, were, were, were not um, sort of felt they'd been unduly slandered. Uh, but I had to set it somewhere and it's just local to me, um, so why not? And, and I think it actually, the setting lends itself well to the theme and everything. I don't want to be too serious, but it somehow works well in something that might be called Middle England sort of thing. I mm. mean, Swindon is an ordinary town. Um, mm. you, know, uh, you can imagine people in, in ross on Wye being settled in their ways and mm. being somewhat disturbed by incomers of any kind. Mm. I don't, I, again, mm. I apologize, uh, Ross and Wise is a lovely place, but there are many places in England which are like that. Um, and, and all of us, as we get older, get set in our ways and have a notion of how things should be and how neat the garden should be and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's a, I don't know whether Hodder are thinking of this going into translation. Do your books go into translation? But it strikes me as a message for the entire world where a kind of middleness exists of settling and thinking this is the way things should be. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, I don't think, I think we might have a French or German translation of this pending. I'm not sure. I can't, I can't really remember. Um, yes. I mean, Middle England, it's, a, it's, it's also works very well for comedy um, because you have, if you have people who, who are fairly intransigent, it's funnier when you, uh, when you literally parachute someone who is completely different right into their midst and then watch them panic and run around like headless chickens 
but it's uh, but uh, Herefordshire is very in much in the middle of uh, middle of England, I suppose. Well, no, it's not really. It's on the Welsh border. Um, okay, it's it's representative of middle middle England, um, and the idea of you know that a village that really wants to maintain the cultural heart of their village and will do anything i mean literally anything to ensure that that's the cultural heart is maintained uh, i think as an, as an interesting uh, trope not just as a, a little village within um middle england uh, but you could also say that um that uh, much hemlock represents um england within you know a much larger place of the world so it's it's a representative i suppose um rather than being sort of specific but uh uh, yes, I, I think it's uh, funny. Yeah, I mean, you know, because all, all they want in the village is to win the Spick and Span Awards. I mean, that's 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 all they seem to talk about. And, you know, then having fates and, you know, and, and jam making sessions and, and things like that. So obviously a family of rabbits are just going to shake that up a little bit. Um, and um, yeah, see, see where it goes. And, and you're very gentle because you're not really mocking those because it's nice to have a Spick and Span Award and it's and it's nice to have tea parties um but it's also quite nice to bring something different along and, uh, yeah well all those things are fine you know there's nothing wrong with spick and span awards you know best kept village awards no. nothing wrong with it no. it's when you use those tropes as as defining factors against incomers that it becomes very very dangerous and and you try and define yourselves within these very narrow terms and anyone else who comes from <laughs> comes from outside, you look as not someone who you can actually gather in to help with your your values, but say no, you have of clearly have different values. So uh, I can clearly see this is not not is something that we we view as an attack. So it's it's I think it's more from sort of that that kind of uh, that kind of viewpoint really. And I know enough people in Swindon who love your books. And are happy that they're set in Swindon. And a writer at the festival uh, I was having a chat with said, Do you know what? It's actually better to be the butt of jokes than to be ignored. Mm. Um, and so, mm. you know, Basingstoke, bless it, isn't. You didn't set your book there, you set it in Swindon. And mm. Ross on Y, you know, it wasn't Shrewsbury, it was Ross on Y. So there's a, there's a, there's a certain fame factor, there's a certain glow that comes with even being made fun of um mm. yeah well i mean i i i, I to, to defend myself i mean the, <laughs> i don't i don't use swindon as a as a joke location i mean it was it was the nearest big town to me so i thought well you know most books are set in london and edinburgh and bristol yeah. you know why can it not be yeah. set in swindon so mm. i decided to set it in swindon and then then yes there was a possibility well let's make it a joke town you know where it's all really really silly and then i thought well no let's let's pull back from that let's actually make it into this dynamic you know hub of you know finance and excellence which has all kinds of wonderful things attached to it in fact i i i, I refer to it in the book as uh, well dresden used to be referred to as and still is it was referred to as the jewel on the l uh, and I refer to Swindon as the jewel on the M4. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I always kind of, I, I like to think that I, I look on, I, I don't make fun of Swindon. I actually say, no, we're going to treat this as it's a, this amazing sort of dynamic place where there's anything can happen. But yes, it, it is slightly unusual and slightly odd. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, I, don't, I, I think I did make fun of Basingstoke and Slough, but I don't know them very well. No, so, uh, no, Swindon, I, I respected Swindon totally. Yeah, so. yeah, and the people are nice there. And uh, one writer, it's lovely you say jewel on the M4, one, one writer who came to the festival said, it's the Tate Modern of the M4 Corridor, the Swindon the, Festival of Literature. You, you uh, see, there you go, you yeah. see? Yeah. 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 It is. Now, do you have a passage, I should have asked you this before, that you might like uh, to, just to give people a flavour, uh, and, and if you don't, I, I have uh, half a paragraph um, that, uh, that that gives a flavour. But 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 if anything comes to mind. Oh um, yeah, um, you caught me caught me slightly slightly on the hop there. Um, but, 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 yeah, um, no, I think you might. Do you have something? The new rabbit intelligence officer had a startled look 
which made it appear that he'd been caught in car headlamps and sometime in the 70s and was still suffering the trauma of it. He would have been a lab stock owing to his white fur, which looked matted and ill-kempt, and he was dressed in an embroidered waistcoat covered by a long duster jacket that had been patched several times with brown corduroy. Rabbits abhorred waste and would often use an item of clothing until it fell off them, um, and so on. Um, mm. it, it, it's lovely English, it's kind of serious, but it immediately makes you think of other things all the time. People who wear clothes until they fall off them. Um, yeah. People having yeah. titles. Uh, yeah, rabbits. I, I like rabbits a lot. And it's and, and when you're when you're when you're, when you're an author, uh, you know, there's this very pompous statement that you know novelists and authors are trying to are trying to improve a a a, a, a sort of a flawed world, if you like. Um, by their writing, and I think that's it's pompous and actually quite grand all, and, and worthy all at the same time. Um, so, so creating the rabbits, I, I was that they're actually a blueprint for perhaps a better a better way of living. And yes, the whole thing about they they really wear things until they fall off them because the rabbits have this. They the rabbits have a um, a saying which is only a fool buys twice. So whenever they buy anything, they'll buy it to use forever. So they drive around in old American automobiles because they can last forever if you look after them. So they have the you know big V8 engine, um, and they like Kenwood mixers and Duralit toasters, and and they don't really like any modern technology if it's just for its own sake. So they can't stand PowerPoint, and they go, "What? Why do we have PowerPoint? Let's just have an overhead projector and a and a, and a, a little floppy film. It's, it makes much more sense." So they they have a sort of rather um, a rather sort of jaundiced look at technology and you know if if it's new okay but does it really help and if it doesn't then we don't really need it and you know so I think there's there's a lot of that so I think this this sort of notion of sustainability and buying things to last um, and mending them when they wear out is, is something that rabbits really uh, really really like and perhaps I think maybe that's something that we could uh, embrace too. Mm. And uh, this is not a spoiler, but you have an aftermath in this book. You have a section which is, yeah, an aftermath. And in it, you have one of the most serious lines I've seen in, in this entire book. And, um, and it just rang so true. And it was, the language of division can always be monetized. Do you remember that? Mm, yeah, I think so. Very topical. Um, yeah. Do, do you want to just say something about that you end on on a kind of serious note yeah i think um i think what it was was in relation to because there's the um uh the the british um british anti-rabbit uh anti-rabbit party right. um in, in the in the uh in the book um and they off uh, well yeah gonna i mean, can't say too much too much uh, spoiler yeah i think i think yeah what they're saying the language of hate can also always be monetized i think we found that a lot with um with a lot of um commentators perhaps on on tv and twitter and the medias is that um inflammatory speech can often uh be monetized uh, very very easily where speech of peace cannot um, and, and that's very worrying. I, I, it, what's interesting, I mean, we're living in a very interesting era, you know, the, the era of, the, um, of uh, social media is a sort of fascinating one that we have just entered and we haven't, as humans, figured out how we deal with this because we've had the last 1.2 million years to figure out how manners work and how we, how we exist with one, one another because we generally speak face to face or within a group of people and if somebody says something a little, you know, off colour or um, shall we say a little bit sort of yeah a bit dodgy then everyone else can sort of go mm, are you sure you know and you you know you'd back off and you'd see it, your peers but if you don't have that if, if you're just sort of really just sort of writing stuff on on your tablet and you have no one there to say really are you sure mm -hmm. then then all of a sudden that 1.2 million years just gets thrown in the bin and we have to kind of re-establish how you know manners and good conduct and respect um, works all over again with with this um, with social media. So we're clearly still not there yet. Um, you know, it's 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 still a work in progress. Um, and I just hope that we can figure it out really before before it all sort of spirals downwards. To be honest, um, Jasper, you hear you can hear um, folks that Jasper 
is a funny man, but he's a very serious man and he cares about <laughs> things. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that about him. And, mm. uh, and he's written a great read and a terrifically thought provoking and entertaining book in this. Um, I urge you to get it from the various sources. You can get it online. Um, Jasper, even though your next book isn't set in Swindon, um, I hope you'll come back again. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but from the Swindon Festival of Literature, um, thank you very much for talking to us about The Constant Rabbit. That is, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. <laughs>